All righty. Welcome. I am Heather Pierce Campbell, the legal website warrior. I'm an attorney and legal coach based here in Seattle, Washington, serving online information entrepreneurs throughout the U.S. and around the world. You are in for a treat today. Welcome to another episode of Guts, Grit, and Great Business. Today with my friend and a brilliant entrepreneur, Ridgely Goldsboro. Welcome, Ridgely. Thank you so much, Heather. I know we've been meaning to do this for a while, and I'm delighted and elated that we finally have the chance. Oh my gosh. Well, you were on my list. I think when we first met, it actually might have been the JVology event right before COVID hit. I think that's right. I that was, that's right. I think it's right. And you were, I think you were wearing your red shoes. And I came up and I was like, look, we got to talk about these red shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I only work in red shoes, Heather. And I will tell you, it's hilarious because now people see me, if they know me, the first thing they do is look down. Is he wearing red shoes? Just got to check. Come make sure. It's so great. Well, and for those of you that are not watching the video and you're just listening to the podcast, Ridgely is in some pretty cool red specs and his red shirt, which I love. So Ridgely, I'm a fan and I was a fan the first time I heard you speak. Um, it was actually at that event that I decided to launch this podcast. Oh, fantastic. How great. I know. I know. We're coming full circle here. So, so great to have you on the show. I know listeners are going to get a lot of value and I can't wait to see what comes out of this. For folks that don't know Ridgely, um, our speaker today believes in solving problems and taking complex topics and making sense out of them. I love that. As, a, as somebody in law, I can really appreciate the skills that it takes to do that. He started his first business at age 16, and since graduating from law school, has founded 45 companies. He has written 19 books, hosted his own television show, and created dozens of online programs on success and prosperity. He is a frequent speaker at top internet marketing conferences, a facilitator for high-level CEO masterminds, and devoted to helping others reach their highest potential. Ridgely, I love that. And I, I especially love the piece at the end about helping others reach their highest potential. Do you know that is the thing, truthfully, that brings me the most joy in life, mm -hmm. seeing people do that, which on the flip side, and I don't know if you can relate to this, means that it's also really painful for me to witness when we don't do that. Yeah, for sure. I can tell you that as a psychologically unemployable serial <laughs> entrepreneur, I have failed far more times than I have succeeded. Mm. And of course, you fail your way forward. Hopefully, you keep learning with each, uh, each setback, if you will. And of those 45 companies, two or three were quite successful. Four or five were moderately successful. And the rest, my dear, were highly educational. <laughs> Right. Well, in business, we get loads, 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 loads of opportunities to learn some things the wrong ways. I think mostly for me, when I talk about, you know, it's painful to watch people not live their highest potential. It's on the personal side and really how that comes out is, you know, and I just believe that's the truth for any of us that to have a happy, fulfilling life in the true sense of, I think what happiness means, it really is living a life in accordance with our values. So when you see somebody out of alignment with their own values, I think that's where the deepest pain comes from. So I think that that's partially true. Okay. But of course, as a fellow attorney, we're going to take issue with lots of things that we each say. I welcome <laughs> this. Yes. And of course, we need to talk about the legal experience, because I remember we chatted about that when we first met. So uh, so living with one's core values, I think, is very important to stay on the straight and narrow mm -hmm. and to not regret, not be, live a life full of regrets. But at the end of the day, if you don't find also some method, some way to raise your life state on an ongoing basis, to raise your life condition, some practice of some kind that gives you the ability to see that not only is the glass half full, actually, even when it's half full of water, it's also half full of air. So it's actually completely full, right? <laughs> and to be able to do to have some way of doing that mm -hmm. on a daily day, every single day. I, I love to think of think of the rhythm of the universe. The sun comes up, the sun goes down every day. You brush your mm -hmm. teeth in the morning, you brush them in the evening, sometimes even at lunch every day. You most of us tend to eat 
every day. We do all these things every day. So the idea that someone that a spiritual or practice that is designed to elevate your life's uh, condition can happen once in a while goes against the natural laws of, of the universe. And for me, it's kind of like, okay, living within my core values, 100% a given. In fact, in the work that I've done with billionaires, integrity, for example, it doesn't even come up in the conversation. It is such a given that it doesn't even ever come up. But living a happy, joyous life, to me, is a lot trickier than just living within your core values. There has to be some kind of method, some kind of mechanism, some kind of practice, some kind of spiritual yearning that takes us to that place of doing whatever it is that you do, sitting in stillness, meditating, praying. I happen to be a Buddhist, so for me, it's chanting every single day, not sometimes, not once in a while, every day to take that whatever condition I wake up with in the morning and say, hmm, not sure I'd like to face the rest of the day with this particular condition. Maybe I could park myself where I need to be and elevate it a little bit. Mm. And if I do that, what I've found is that I never, ever, ever have a bad day. Mm. When I slack on my spiritual practice, then I roll the dice. I love, I love your reframe and I 100% agree. Um, it just so happens that one of my core values is learning, right? It is progress. And so that is something that I am just naturally driven to do and also, you know, consistently work towards. Um, and it is a connect, like, I, I do find that I tend to intersect with people where you can either readily recognize like, yes, they're on that train of like, how do we make progress? How do we elevate our condition in life, right? Our state in life versus those that just don't, that are not curious, that are not motivated. What do you think distinguishes the two? I think that most people die in their twenties and are buried in their eighties. They're sleepwalking their way through mm. life. They settle. They they start to listen to somebody else's story. And as my mentor Jim Rohn used to say, if you don't design your own life, you will fall into the design of someone else. And guess what they have designed for you? Not much. Right. 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 So I think it's an active practice. It's a the, the idea of being a lifelong learner. <laughs> I went back to school and got another degree, a master's degree in value creating education and global citizenship. Mm. Last December, I finally it took me four years to get it done at DePaul University, just because I was interested. So now I have a master's in education. I have zero desire to become an academic. Right. I just want to know, learn what does it mean to be a global citizen? Well, I love that piece of it. Right. Yes. And it's all about dialogic engagement and recognizing things like Right now, you and I are in the process of co-creation and true dialogue is always a co-creative space. I'm not waiting for you to stop so that I can start talking. I'm looking at you, we're interacting together, we're going back and forth with eye contact, body language, et cetera, to create something. That's how I wanna live my life. Always co-creating with those around me, finding a way to learn from those that disagree with me, finding mm -hmm. a way to, reflect on my own behavior. If someone is upset for whatever the reason, which by the way, happens almost never, but it does happen. <laughs> I am married. So, <laughs> so I mean, all right. It would be weird if it never happened. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I, you know, it's so interesting. I love, first of all, I love the word and the topic of co-creation. And that's always how I have felt about this podcast is like, it's not something that I've created. I, I launched it, but you know, this is, I don't know what episode number this will be probably in the hundred and thirties by the time it's published, maybe 140, like 140 guests mm -hmm. have helped co-create <laughs> this podcast, right? right? It's yeah. And I think so often we can forget that in life. We feel like everything's on our shoulders. It's on us to do. It's on us to figure out. It's, you know what I mean? This whole um, responsibility thing. And it's, 
it really, when you look at life, there's, a, there's very little that you do on your own ever. You know, it's interesting because um, on what I found with my podcast is that although it is always a co-creative process, which is super fabulous, there are also certain themes and certain concepts that rise to the top over and over and over. And that's why I encourage everyone that's listening right now to tap in over and over and over with Heather because those themes start to sink and you start to hear the success principles for business and life repeatedly through different people's expression of them. And you can take in a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And at the end of the day, we are all about as successful as our 10 closest friends. So I highly recommend when needed, upgrade your friends. How do you do that? By gaining new information, new data, putting that into your system so that you see things differently with new eyes and can make different choices, newer choices. Mm, such an important reminder. And, you know, the truth of that, like, and I think people have said it in different ways, you know, you're the combination of your 10 closest friends. I've heard five, but it really is true. You just think about, you know, even how we're relating right now, like who you spend time with the whole process of I'm reading the book right now. Um, oh, what is it called? The body it's about over. It's about healing trauma. I'll, I'll look up the name. It's something about the body um, keeps the score. The body keeps the score, mm -hmm. right? But, but the way that we are designed to socialize, to be in community with people, the way that mirror, mirror neurons work, right? So they've done studies showing that, you know, and they can measure this like in chimpanzees or something, put on the, the electrodes and measure what parts of their brain are lighting up that when they're watching somebody, you know, get a banana or do something like the portion of their brain lights up as if they were the ones eating it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it just, it really is so true. I just want to underscore like the truth of what you've just said about us becoming the people that we are closest to. It's how we're designed. Right. Yeah. Jim, Jim Brown used to also say, don't worry so much about who you are right now but worry immensely about who you are becoming. Mm. And I thought that was very profound. Worry immensely about who are you becoming? Like, what are you doing to evolve? What are you doing to move forward? What are you doing to make tomorrow better than yesterday? Uh, I had a, a, an old Japanese gentleman. He was the green grocer at a grocery store in Los Angeles. And he was a very, very spiritual man who'd been spiritual for decades and decades. And so I was at, sitting in a discussion and somebody said to him, so how do you define happiness? And he paused for a moment. This is the green grocer, right? The yeah. vegetable guy. And he said, every day my coffee tastes a little bit better and my wife is a little more beautiful. Mm. Wow. You're like, hmm. <laughs> Maybe my life is a little too complicated. Okay, I'm just saying. <laughs> I might start commuting with some vegetables or something. Right. Yeah, the simplicity of that, but the power of it, right? Around yeah. mindset. And here's another thought. How many people do you know that could give you a definition of what happiness looks like for them? How many people do you know, here's an, another provocative question, that could tell you, What's their number? So people are chasing and they're running without stopping to define mm. what are you trying to accomplish? And oh, by the way, what steps are you taking to go in that direction? And on top of that, how are you measuring it? How are yes. you keeping score, so to speak, to let yourself know that you are on track, keep doing it, or you're off track and you need to pivot and optimize? and shift in some way? Those are very tough questions. And I, I have these conversations with very smart people who do mm -hmm. not have an answer. Yeah. These are like, really, what is happiness for you? What's it look like? I can tell you, for me, it's super simple. I spend a month a year on the slopes skiing. I spend a month a year snorkeling with my beautiful wife and 10 months a year in service to others. And mm -hmm. 
Love that. Yeah, that that whole concept of happiness is so interesting. I think that, um, you know, some people like as I, you ask, I, and I have asked some people in my life, and you get like the oversimpli- oversimplification, like, oh, well, it's freedom or whatever, but they don't really go to the next step of like, what does that mean? How does it show up in your life? How do you know if you actually feel free, right? Mm-hmm. Well, and also, do you, are you making the concrete steps to make that happen? Mm-hmm. Like, for example, what's your number? What's your number? At the end of the day, assets mean nothing, zero. My brother, he's a big real estate guy, and he has a very large piece of dirt in Kansas City. They bought it a long time ago. It's worth seven figures today. I said to him, I said, how much is that? How much money is that thing making for you? Oh, man, it's costing us money. Oh, so it's costing you money because it's just a piece of dirt sitting there and you're paying the taxes and you're paying the maintenance, you're paying this, you're paying that. And I said to him, you know something? Let me tell you something, bro. Okay, great. It's worth a lot, supposedly. But assets don't mean anything in terms of happiness and freedom. What you need is flow. If you have enough flow, you can do whatever you want, whenever you want, with whoever you want. If you don't have enough flow, you can't do squat. And therefore, hello, can we look at the plan in front of us and ask ourselves, what are you doing to create that flow that gives you the freedom to think about what freedom even means? Because most people can vaguely come up with some concept of freedom, but they've never experienced it. They don't know. Yeah. Go, go de- right. No, it's so true. I know exactly what you're saying. Tell us a little bit more about this concept of flow. So if you think about it, you have certain needs on an ongoing basis. The bills are kind of like the weeds in the garden. They just keep coming. And like, if you want a beautiful garden, you got to pull out the weeds. If you want to not get in trouble, you got to pay your bills. So I don't invest in assets unless they produce flow. Mm. I want to know, oh, there's a treasury bill out right now. By the way, you should probably know about this. I'll send you the link if you want. Uh, You can invest, not a lot. The government says you can only invest $10,000. But this is a treasury bill by the government that's paying 9.6%. Oh. Hello. I found out about it. I said, I'm in. And my wife is in per social security number is 10K. And my business is in also. And I'm down with that too. And we all bought it. And, and so I take, I make money and I invest in flow. Mm. I invest in assets that produce a return. Yep. Not things that appreciate for later. That's cool. That's one strategy when you're very young. And I think that's okay. But as you get a little bit more mature, you got to be thinking, how do I reach the point at which I no longer want to pursue financial reward and do other things with my time without ever having to think about where is the flow to take care of the responsibilities that I have? Mm. And oh, by the way, what is that number? Because otherwise you could be on that hamster wheel, chasing that almighty dollar forever and ever and ever with no end in sight for no particular reason Mm -hmm. just see it so true what do you do to create flow i don't buy real estate to appreciate i buy into real estate conglomerates that build warehouses for amazon and send me a Mm -hmm. coupon right flow i want Mm -hmm. flow all i care about is flow how do i take ten thousand dollars and convert that into flow, right? $100 a month. If I can take $10,000 and convert it into 100 bucks a month, I have $100 a month more flow than I did Mm. last month. You only need to do that for a little while before you realize, I really kind of only work if I want to anymore. Mm. Just saying. Right? Flow. Fabulous place to be. So, Will you share with us, because we didn't, we didn't, we skipped, we went right into some of the good stuff. Will you share with us a bit about your journey into entrepreneurship? I mean, obviously you've got a phenomenal story. You've created, let me go back here, 45 companies, right? Mm -hmm. Share, Share with us a little bit about how you either 
jumped into or got bit by the entrepreneurship bug? You know, my dad was an attorney also, probably why I went to law school. And one summer, like right out of high school, I started working for a client of his who was a pest control company. And I was, you know, going around to houses, spraying chemicals around there and getting paid whatever the going wage was back then. And I remember thinking, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. This doesn't make any sense to me. I don't get it. I'm not building anything. I don't like this. And then one day I had to climb under somebody's house and spray some chemicals. And I accidentally kicked a pipe and it happened to be the sewage pipe. And sewage started spewing all over the base of uh, underneath of the house. And um, I had been working for a little bit less than one month. And um, they said, well, you need to go back under that house and fix that sewage. And I said, no, <laughs> I'm not, doing not that. my job. And they said, well, you can go over there and clock out. And I said, thank you very much. I appreciate you. And that was it. And that was the only job I have ever had in my life mm. that I that wasn't in some way entrepreneurial. Mm. So then I immediately, so here's me. They're opening a new French restaurant, super high end. My mom ran catering companies where I grew up in Spain. And so I knew a lot about, you know, lower end restaurants and stuff like that. And I could halfway become a waiter or whatever. And I knew that waiters made a lot of money in high end restaurants. At least that was my supposition. So I go walking in there and because I speak French and it was a French restaurant, Right. I was, well, I was just going to say that I'm having a flashback where you speak like 89 languages. It's not even referenced in your bio. So I'm going to revise your bio for you and I'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you. <laughs> not 89, just five. So, so I get myself talked into this, uh, this job, pretending like I have all this experience from my mom's catering company. And I'll never forget this woman from Brooklyn, New Yorker, tough New York woman. She says, she looks over at me, she says, Ridgely, you don't know what you're doing, do you? And I had the presence of mind, fortunately, to say, actually, no, ma'am. <laughs> he said, I got you, I teach you. And I was able to keep the job. So I went from making eight bucks an hour or whatever the number was, maybe it was six at that time, I don't know, to making 150 to $250 a night, right? And I thought to myself, I am never working a job for anybody else again, period, end of story. And yes, I've made colossal mistakes. I've had monumental failures with various companies, but the idea of working on someone else's dream that is not my own, at least some kind of co-creation, it's just, I can't do it. It mm -hmm. makes no sense. I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you just came that way. It sounds like, I mean, obviously you had some experiences that also redirected you, but you had the the gumption to just go do it. Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I was like, and you always, you, you get what you put in, right? So I get to the University of Virginia and I'm like, okay, where's the high paying job that's fun? Okay, so the most highly paid job on campus that I can find is refereeing soccer games at $15 per 45 minute game. So in an afternoon, you could do four games and make 60 bucks in three hours. I'm like 20 bucks an hour. That's good. And I'm outside and I'm running around and I'm having fun. And I'm doing all this. So I go to the head ref and I said, so when does the schedule come out? He says, oh, it's always on Friday at one o'clock. I always do it at the same time. I said, oh, so you do it over lunch? He says, yeah. I said, hey, would you like some help making that schedule? He said, that'd be great. So I show up to help him make the schedule. Now, why is that? because then I'm the one who posts it for him. And therefore I can sign myself up for all the games that I know one team's already dropped out and they're gonna forfeit, you get paid anyway. Uh, number two on the list was top sorority games where the good girls were, the cute girls were gonna be. Number three, and then down the list to the most schleppy games or whatever, who do you think knew more about the system by the end of the year? Ridgely, the guys graduating. There's never been a head referee who's a second year person in the history of University of Virginia sports, but who did the guy select? Me. So of course, now I'm in charge of making the schedule. Now I sign myself up for all the games that are gonna forfeit, for all the games that have the sorority girls that all the game, whatever, et cetera, and run the entire thing. And then 
they go and they change the policy and say, you know, the, the people who are in charge, they're charging us too much money for admin hours, whatever we put in. So we're just going to pay a flat $150 per week um, as an admin fee to the head referee. Plus, you can get paid however many games you referee, right? Takes me like two hours, right? So now they're paying me 150 bucks for the two hours of the admin stuff. And then my brother comes along behind me. So of course, what do I do? I pass it over to him and we had the dynasty for five years. Why? Because I said, can I come help you? Can I do a little mm. bit extra than everybody else? The only difference between ordinary and extraordinary is the extra. Mm. Yeah, it's such a powerful reminder. I am. Um... When I graduated law school, it was the worst time in like 30 years. 9-11 had just happened the fall before, right? Law firms around the country were, were closing their doors as far as new hires, putting moratoriums on new hires, right? We were not in a growth phase. I had classmates that got jobs and then had them rescinded. I had traveled abroad my second year and actually worked for the British government and so I didn't have a stateside job lined up. But when I graduated, I, I had taken my third year of law school and issues and solo practice class. And my mom had died during law school, right? Which completely changed my path. And so like you, I was like, you know what? I'm not interested in going and sitting in a cubicle and drafting cell phone tower leases for a client I don't care about. Mm -hmm. Right. I want to do work that I enjoy, but it meant doing the opposite of what everybody else was doing to get jobs. Yeah. Right. And I, I learned in a hurry, like you have to pay attention to what other people are doing and pretty much don't do that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I, I have all the respect for anybody's path, whatever that may be mm -hmm. for them, but entrepreneurs are unique beasts entrepreneurs have very bad memories. They forget about the failures really quickly and they have underdeveloped senses of fear. Totally, and <laughs> overdeveloped senses of optimism. And oh, by the way, studies have demonstrated that optimistic people are more successful. Why? Because they find new ways of making things happen. They find new ways of looking at a problem and recasting yes. it as a challenge or an issue or whatever. I started traveling when I was six years old. My parents were divorced. I stopped with this weird thing called the pandemic. So I traveled my entire life. I've been in 50 countries so far, spoken in 35 of them, had businesses on four continents, right? All over the world. And then the pandemic hit. And it was like, oh, reinvention time. So in the last few years with the pandemic, I've discovered I really do kind of like being at home. It's kind of weird. I enjoy more time with my wife. My bed is more comfortable than hotels. And I've made really good friends at the yoga studio. Wow, very interesting. So you reinvent yourself. I was like, okay, I'm not traveling as much. And you know what? I'm never going back to traveling like I used to. I say no to so many things nowadays. Like, forget it. I'm not oh, needed. That sounds insane, right? I know so many people like you that were just on insane travel schedules. All the time. I was like, nope, not doing that anymore. I'm done. I look at my schedule and say, wow, okay, so I'm traveling the next month and a half. And then I'm not traveling at all for a month and a half. Then I'm traveling for a month. Then I'm not traveling for two. That's weird, <laughs> as opposed to being gone 50 to 60% of the time. Right. Yeah, that's intense. Well, the point that you make about optimists, you know, being more likely to essentially see their way through a problem. I mean, you think about that on its face. If, if you think there's a solution to a problem, even if it's an extraordinary problem, aren't you more likely to find it? Yeah. Right? And you're more likely to go after something and learn what else do you need to know, mm -hmm. what other things need to shift in the process of finding it. Because mm -hmm. if you're not doing anything, if you're sitting there worried about the problem and hanging out worried about the problem, guess what's not going to change? The problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just saying. And oh, yeah. by the way, you've got to get a fresh perspective. You know, one of the funny things about um, about my personal spiritual practice is I'm very clear, and I'll just say what I'm doing for the people who are just listening. 
if your problem is right in front of your face to the point where you just can't see anything but the problem, it's really hard to do anything about the problem. Mm. What works is to have something that enables you to distance yourself so that you can see all kinds of possibilities about the problem and look at it mm. from different angles and tap in and maybe catch a resource, call a mentor or a friend or somebody, get a different take on it. And now suddenly the problem's not a problem. It's kind of just a thing. Yeah. There's like a whole challenge over here. There's a whatever. Right. And you got to have that methodology. You got to have that mechanism by which you can separate yourself and look at it from different ways. Mm. What does that also entail? Having a high life state, just like we talked about at the very beginning. If your life condition is low, everything you see comes through the eyes of a low life condition. Yes. Sorry. So it's going to look more negative. It's going to look more dark. It's going to look more difficult, more challenging, more mm -hmm. heavy, as opposed to if your life condition is high, then you kind of look at things and go, man, that is a really interesting curveball. Hmm. Let me just take a little walk and think about that one for a minute. Yeah. And just keep going. Yeah. Oh, it's so true that, um, was having a conversation, I think, on a past episode about how we become more resourceful, right? And it's so interesting, like, when you talk about being in the mindset of a lower life state, like, and for anybody, like, let's look at the pandemic, for anybody who was cruising along feeling pretty good at life, and then felt like that was a major cur curveball. And I know plenty of folks who went through tough times just related to some of the conditions of the pandemic, like, being in a lower life state, whether it's a depressed state of mind or inability to, you know, really look for solutions also casts a long shadow backwards. This is the interesting thing about the human mind, right? It doesn't just change your current reflection and your current state, but even how you remember things looking backwards mm -hmm. and vice versa, you can heal that with a positive state, right? It can actually fix the way that we think about our past. 100% because everything in a high life state becomes a golden memory. We all, sometimes we forget that everyone is the sum total of all the thoughts, words, and deeds they have participated in until this very moment. Therefore, everything from your past shapes who you are right now. If who you are right now is awesome, then everything from your past is also awesome. And what is that? It's a state of mind. It's a mindset. Mm -hmm. It's an embracing of all that happened before. I had a very difficult childhood with a very abusive mm -hmm. stepfather. To me now, mm -hmm. it's just a golden memory. Mm -hmm. There were some really rough times. There were some really crazy times, some really crazy times that taught me how to be more empathetic, that helped me understand someone who's deeply suffering, that helps me to know what it looks like to be abused, heavily mm -hmm. abused, and whatever. And now all of that is like, some people say, well, aren't you still mad? Aren't you still angry? I said, no, I'm not. All of that led to this. And as long as this is good and evolving and moving forward, then all of that was also a part of that journey that I don't regret one ounce of. Mm. So it's just such a powerful concept. And it takes me back to the quote that you shared earlier in the conversation about worry less about who you are right now and worry more about who you're becoming, right? Also acknowledging for folks that are listening that feel like they're in a lower state than they want to be, like worry less about that than the fact that you actually, you know, at any point can be changing into the next version of yourself. That, That's right. Yeah. And, and, and oh, by the way, I think it's also, it's important to be fair and truthful when it comes to business, when it comes to shifting your general life state, et cetera. None of that is easy. And I, I you see these gurus that, or so-called gurus who are teaching something that they themselves have not even done, right? Mm. Or, or, or they're espousing that something is, that you can do this and this, and you're gonna get this crazy result. And I am that guy who is, going to tell you that that's a bunch of baloney and that if you really want to succeed at something the only place that success comes before work is in the dictionary so be prepared to do some work because mm. that's what it really takes 
you have to put some time in. You have to make the sacrifice. On my podcast, that is the, the, the two, the absolute top two things that I hear over and over and over and over are the keys to success are one, you've got to be willing to pay the price, sacrifice, mm. whatever you want to call it. And number two, never give up. Mm. About persistence and resilience and being willing to pay the price. Do what you got to do. Those two things. Those two th at the top of every single person's list are those two. Mm. Originally, it's like, you know, a thing or two about guts, grit and great business. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it really is. I mean, and you and I were talking before we went live today about the reason why I launched this podcast, that that whole concept of, you know, perseverance and sticking to something. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know we just cannot remind ourselves often enough that it is a journey and that, you know, nobody does it in a year, two years, three years, even five years, right? It is. Well, people can get lucky temporarily, yeah. but the skills that get you to X are not going to get you to Y and the skills mm -hmm. that get you to Y are not going to get you to Z. So if you're not evolving and you want to get to Z and right now you're at X, sorry, it ain't going to happen. It's just not going to happen until you make the shift first until you make that decision to invest in the greatest asset that you have which is yourself and learn those things that you don't know now that you need to know in order to get to y and then to z there's no easy way around this and oh by the way if somehow you got lucky it would all collapse anyway if you didn't learn the things that you need to run the z that you're looking for it's like you know a thing or two about the human mind um, Liz, I'm using that as a segue because you have a program. I've heard you talk about mind types and I don't know a lot about it, but I've heard you present on it. I've never been on the inside of your programs or services, right? I probably should be. Um, do you want to share with us a little bit about what you're doing now? Cause you obviously have a wealth of experience. You are serving and working with people in the entrepreneurial space. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing right now. So I've been blessed. I've written five books on emotional intelligence and brain biology with a very specific focus, which is how do human beings make decisions? What does that look like? And oh, by the way, what can we do understanding the brain biology and how the brain works to influence people to make decisions in our favor? which, oh, by the way, for an entrepreneur, includes the decision to buy your products or services. And so in doing this work and breaking it down and making it simple for people to understand, at the end of the day, there are two major portions of the brain. One is the thinking brain and the other is the feeling brain. The thinking brain is called the neocortex. It's around the perimeter of the brain, if you're looking at a cross section from above. And the feeling brain is at the heart of the brain, which is one of the reasons we call it the heart space. Here's the thing. The thinking brain thinks. It does data, information, mm -hmm. features, benefits, words, speech, language. The fact that we understand each other right now is because of the thinking brain or neocortex. What it doesn't do is make decisions. Decisions are made in the limbic or feeling brain, which is at the heart of the brain. We make decisions based on a feeling, and then we justify those decisions with logic. And it always happens in that sequence. Feeling first, logic second. Mm -hmm. How many times have you had this experience, Heather, where all the data and information pointed at making the, this one particular decision at this moment, and at the very last second, you go, whoa, 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 stop. This doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. That's your limbic brain kicking in. So the challenge is that most people don't understand this fundamental principle of how the brain works. And as a result of that, they target their marketing or their messaging at the thinking brain. They mm -hmm. explain what they make, what they offer, what they sell, what they manufacture. And here's the, here's the, the little secret about all that. Nobody cares. Nobody cares because somebody right down the street makes the exact same thing. What people care about is who are you? What do you stand for? What are you about? What do you believe? And do I resonate with that? Mm -hmm. So let me be a little bit blunt and transparent and a tiny bit harsh with everybody. It doesn't matter how talented you are. 
it doesn't matter how good your product is, how good your services are, unless you can genuinely and authentically show up for people so that they can make a decision in your favor. Because before they ever buy your product or your service, first they got to buy you. Mm -hmm. And therefore expressing you to the world is super, super important using limbic messaging. And watch this, Heather, I'm going to use a limbic message right now and fully transparent. You know why? Because your success matters. Would you agree? Yes. I just used it. Right. You didn't even know what happened. Right. right? It was a, I said, because your success matters. And you immediately started nodding your head. Mm -hmm. Right. So when you understand how to use limbic messaging, you mm -hmm. gain ninja powers of influence over others mm -hmm. and you attract those who believe what you believe that become the best ideal customers that you can ever get to build a great business and a great life. Mm -hmm. So for those that are, um, let's say, suspicious or naysayers, is this about manipulating others? So. One could say that if you absolutely knew very well how to use limbic messaging with each personality type, mm -hmm. you could. Mm -hmm. I like to say influence. Mm -hmm. right? If I have a, I feel if you have a great product or a great service, it is your obligation to society and humanity to become really good at connecting with people so that they can benefit from your product or service. Right. And, and how, how many people do you know? And do I know who are phenomenal at what they do? Heart centered, amazing, like very much in the mode of service, but they're not salespeople. They're not necessarily a natural, even business person. And yet they need to create a thriving business to have the impact that they want to have. That's right. Which means that even if you're not a salesperson, I'm not saying you have to become a salesperson, but what I am <laughs> saying is that you have to become great at expressing you to the world in an authentic mm -hmm. way so that you enable people to have the right to raise their hand and say, Heather, she gets me. I relate to her. Her message resonates with me. Therefore, I want to use her services, mm -hmm. not the person down the street. Right. So you have to become good at this. You have to be an expert at authenticity and genuineness and putting out who you really are to the world mm -hmm. so that people start nodding their head in your favor. You begin the process of inducing a yes state so that when you put an offer in front of them, they're already predisposed to say yes. Mm. Well, and I love the piece that you said, if you have a product or a service that you believe in, right? For me, that's an absolute must as a starting point. You yeah. have to absolutely love what it is that you're bringing to the world in order to be a great. And when I say like, they don't know sales, like many people, I think cringe at even the topic of sales, but it is that in business, we have to have those transactions where we enroll somebody in order for them to get the benefit and for our business to win and for, and for it to be a great scenario for both people, right? And I think a lot of people get stuck before they're able to make that transaction. Yeah, and I don't want to, I don't want to go too far down a rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. You know, you wake up in the morning and you're next to your partner and you got to sell that person on loving you for the day. <laughs> you see your kids and you got to sell them on liking you. And, and some of yeah. us have to sell a little harder. Let's be clear, Ridgely. Right. So, so give me a break. Everybody is in sales on one level or another. Now, you may not feel that, oh, you might be like cringing at this moment, but everybody's in sales. You got to sell your friends on liking you. You got to sell your community on respecting you. There is an element to sales to everything. Here's how you make it easier be genuine and authentic. Mm. I, I can tell you, Heather, I have people that I sometimes disagree with or have a different opinion from or et cetera. I don't have bad meetings. I just don't. Like, never. And I've, I've not made some pretty bold statements, but I don't have bad meetings. Why? Because I'm just going to show up as me. And if it doesn't work for you, cool. You go your way, I'll go mine. And I respect you. And if there's something I can do for you, great. We don't have to do something together. I just show up yeah. and I believe that the world is run by people that show up. 
So with that said, if you're going through hell, don't stop. Yeah. You got to keep showing up. Yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah. Well, so I clearly you've done so much work in this area. I think you said you you've written five books on basically human mindset, you know, psychology type of stuff. Um, yep. Talk to us a little bit about your mind types, how, how people can use what it is that you have to teach, how they can better understand their clients or customers. Cause it sounds like you can break people out into like subsets, right? Categorize them in certain ways. Yeah. So the mind types is a, a personality assessment, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. The difference between it and some of the other things that are out there which by the way, I have a lot of respect for is the majority of the assessments that are out there require a coach or an expert to interpret them. So for me, I took myself uh, a challenge and I said, okay, self, here's the deal. If you have to explain a concept more than just sharing a concept, it's not clear enough. And so I spent the last 12 years perfecting a system that I use cartoons, I use gamification, I use learning to break people down into a primary, secondary, and tertiary mind type mm -hmm. that anybody can understand, immediately implement, and use to, for their benefit, first of all, to express their authentic self, but also to understand how to get along with others. Most people that work together, what do they know about the person in the next cubicle? Oh, they're married. They think, I think they have two kids. Oh, and they have, oh, I know they have a golden retriever because they got a picture of the golden right there. And, that, and that's all about all they know about the people they work with. As opposed to, I know who you are. I know what your mind type is. I know what your superpower is. I know what your kryptonite is. Therefore, I know how you see the world. I know what you can bring to the table. And I know what I need to compensate for in working with you so that we can be successful together. When you know that about people, it takes culture to an entirely different level. You're talking about increased efficiencies, understanding, greater empathy among people, the ability to get why somebody's having a tough day, what's bothering them so much. And it is super, super effective in messaging. Because if I know the seven mind types are the giver, it's all about make, adding value, making a difference, et cetera. The connector, all about building trust. The problem solver, all about making sense and clarifying and simplifying things. The innovator, looking for a better way to do everything. The perfectionist, the guy that does, gal that does things the right way. Then you have the rebel, the person that's outside the box, and the master, the big geeks. Seven mm -hmm. different types. All of us have a primary, secondary, and tertiary. When mm -hmm. I know who you are, I then know that there are keywords that are associated with your mind type, your primary mind type, mm -hmm. that, are as that are as powerful as my saying your name. So Heather, you respond immediately from anywhere. It triggers a limbic response. It mm -hmm. touches you where you live. All of the mind types have keywords that are just as powerful as Heather. Therefore, if I know what your mind type is, I have ninja powers of influence over you. And to understand, <laughs> excuse me, to understand somebody's mind type, do they have to go through your test, your system, or do you teach people how to quickly be able to determine which mind type they are? Both. Both. <laughs> so you got to get it from somewhere. You got to get new information from a source, right? Mm -hmm. So the source can be either Ridgely hops on a webinar and then teaches a bunch of people about mind types, or they can go check out uh, one of the courses I have, which it, I have one that's actually free and mm -hmm. people can go check that out and they can self-diagnose because at the end of the day, the person most capable of determining who you are is you. Right. Well, I, I would guess that problem solver has to be in your one of three. Is it top? Yeah. It's number one. Yeah. What are your next two? Giver is my mm -hmm. secondary and innovator is my third. Ah, super fun. Yeah. Well, I love that. And it, you know, I think, cause there's a lot of discussions in, I think the entrepreneurial space and especially for people who really 
they're conscientious about their business, about the way they do business. They, they want to do things the right way. And from a place of honesty and authenticity, and I think some people get tired of the, you know, the NLP and all the, like the ways that we're quote unquote sold on things. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, I, I still think there's a place for these systems and like the type of information that you're teaching that help us better understand who we're talking to and how to communicate effectively with them. Well, so, so here's a major distinction. This is really important. Yeah, you can learn sales techniques. You can learn NLP. You can learn how to manipulate or move people or influence their brains. And then you attract three types of customers or prospects. The good, the bad, and the ugly. And the reality is, if you want to build an amazing business, you want neither the bad and certainly not the ugly. You only want the good. So it's not about trying to convince somebody out there mm -hmm. to do something. It's about sharing who you are so effectively that those people who believe what you believe are attracted to you. Mm -hmm. And then you find where you have common ground. It's not about trying to talk to them. It's about expressing you to the world. That's what is more effective if what you're looking for is attracting only ideal customers, not knuckleheads. Everybody remembers their last <laughs> bad client. You talk about it for decades right. in your career. There's right. just these few that stand out as being, oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. These oh, I'm so... I'm so glad you mentioned that again. I think that really clarifies where this fits for people, right? That authentic expression of self so that you're drawing in the right people who want to connect with that. Become a giant magnet for ideal customers and you will mm -hmm. have an amazing business and an incredible life. Mm -hmm. Attract everybody and you ain't going to get that. Right. <laughs> so sorry. Right. Yeah, that's so right. Um, oh my gosh, I feel like there's so much more that I could ask you about. I've got a couple of questions. Would you share, just because I know you've you've got a journey and you've learned some things, will you share a time or two where things were really rough for you and what you did to make your way through that or or create a turning point in your life? So right before 9-11, I had a personal growth company that sold 75% of our products at events. I had five travel teams leaving virtually every week. And then 9-11 hit and every event in the United States of America was canceled. Every single one of them. So you've or been through this before, the pandemic so, effect. This is round two for me, round two. <laughs> wow. So round one, uh, my expenses were $10,000 a day, right? To run the company. It was a st substantial company. And their the writing was on the walls. There's no way this company survives. And that will be the one company that I actually bankrupted. Mm. Well, then you got to reinvent yourself. And bankrupting a company is, as you know, as an attorney, it's a brutal emotional journey. It is one of those... You really got to ask yourself, where do you go from here? What do you do? And that's when I woke up and said, stop being a chicken. Start writing like you've been saying you're going to do forever. And that's when I wrote my first and then second, third, fourth, and now 19 books. Wow. Started in the wake of the first massive, massive loss. Mm. And... And no, we don't need to belabor the pain, but the pain right. of going through a bankruptcy, firing everybody, Ugh. fire sailing everything that you know, having to talk investors off the ledge when they're about to file a massive lawsuit, all, all of that, brutal, just brutal. But you got to stop, take a minute, go through the pain, experience that thing, internalize that. Be okay with, okay, it failed. This thing failed. This yeah. thing failed. Doesn't mean my life failed. Doesn't mean I am a failure. This thing failed. 
take responsibility for that failure. What do I need to learn moving forward? So right before the pandemic, check this out. I was speaking in Nassau in the Bahamas and somebody came up to me right at 30 CEOs and they came up, one person came up to me, <laughs> funny, her name was Heather actually. And she <laughs> said, she said, do you know who I am? I said, no. She said, well, I'm Heather and I run a speakers company, an event company in Canada. And I'm on the board of the North American Speakers and Event Planners Association. And this is one of the best presentations I've ever seen in my life. I'd like you to come give a keynote for the annual event where there will be two to 300 people like me who organize 20 to 30 big events and 50 to 60 smaller events per year. Okay, now let's put this into context. That means that the people in that room are responsible for five to 6,000 events every single year collectively. Mm -hmm. And Ridgely is pretty good in front of the room. Had that event happened, I would never have stopped traveling yeah. until the end of my career. I would have been booked out the yin yang for 20 years. No kidding. That's, that's a fact. Instead, the pandemic hit. And every single job that I had, many tens of thousands of dollars lined up, every single one of them was canceled without exception. Every one of them, right? So then you're like, haven't I seen this movie before? I'm like, call talk about some deja vu. So deja vu, right. not really look at that. And yet because of experience, because of having been around the block, because of working really hard to maintain a high life condition, a high life state, as my spouse is freaking out, I'm saying, don't worry about it. It's fine. We'll figure it out. We'll be fine. Mm. And that's when everybody went online. And suddenly from getting on airplanes and, and going yourself to bring the message to people in person, you start bringing the message to people online and it changed everything. And so now the very things that I offer online are what I used to go somewhere to deliver. And I don't have to leave home. Right. You don't have to I leave your bed. You don't have to leave your wife. I can get up in the morning, dive in my own swimming pool, swim a few laps, and then come down to my office. Boop. Yeah. I actually like it a lot better. <laughs> right? Isn't it fascinating to think of those points in time that were very clear, like left fork in the road, right fork in the road? Well, and both of them for the first one, right before 9-11, was very, very painful. I will tell you, you said, you asked me for one more as a low. That was yeah. very, very painful, rough couple of months. Really had to work through those, maybe mm -hmm. six months. The second one, it wasn't even a thing. It was like, oh, okay. And now the government is sending everybody money. Hmm, that's bizarre. Well, I've certainly paid in enough over my many, many years of being an entrepreneur. I'll take as much as they're going to give me and put it to good use. Right. And was that the, the benefit of both experience and the work that you've done on mindset? Of course. Yeah. A hundred percent. And uh, however, I would tell you that the work I did on mindset is more important. Hmm. A lot of people can have a lot of experiences that are bad and they keep repeating them over and over and over because if you don't change your mindset, you can change your apartment, you're gonna have the same problem. You can change your job, you're gonna face the same issue. You can change your partner and you're gonna find that the same things show up again. Mm, isn't that a true story? So mindset is more important than experiences. If you work on your mindset, you're gonna have different experiences. Mm. If you don't work on your mindset, you're just gonna have the same experience over and over. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, nope, that's a great distinction. So for folks that are like, hmm, I need to check out Ridge, Ridgely. I probably need to order one or more of his 19 books. I need to look into this course. Where do you like to send people online to connect with you or your work? I think that the most important thing you can do is go get the free course. There's mm -hmm. no one listening, not a single human listening to this that could not benefit from going to customerconversionformula.com and signing up for the free course. If there's some things in there that you like that you want to buy, great. 
If not, get the course anyway. Do yourself a favor. Learn about your mind type. Learn about limbic messaging. Learn how to be authentic and express it. It's a very comprehensive course. I'm one of those believers in give a lot. Don't be afraid to give the farm away. I'm not afraid at all. I'll give you everything. Because the people that are smart say, if he's given me this, what else does he have? That he's right. I want to look me. behind door number three. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I always know, just give away, give it away, give it away, give it away. It's a $500 course and it's free. Oh, Customerconversionformula.com. Just go there and get it. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, if you're listening, I'm going to be on my way there right after this as well. If you are listening, hop over, we will share that link and anything else that you want us to share originally at the show notes page, which is www.legalwebsitewarrior.com forward slash podcast. Ridgely, do you do, I just have to ask in this day and age, do you do social media or are you not a social media guy? So I have people who do social media for me. <laughs> Good answer. <laughs> so Just... I am not active on social media. It's one okay. of those things. It's uh, I have people who take care of it. Uh, we have various Facebook groups and things like that. I just find that there are only so many hours in the day. And the 80-20 rule is very, very real. 80% of your results are going to come from 20% of what you do. And I don't like distractions. I don't watch television, uh, you know. Very yeah. No, I'm with you. I, I joke that my whole goal is to never have to be on social media and have a business that still runs okay. like a machine. So I love that. If you want to connect with Ridgely, start with his course, customerconversionformula.com. We will share that on the show notes page. Ridgely, what? Two things. Is there a question that you wish I had asked? And then also, what final thought would you like to leave with people? I thought our dialogue was spectacular. Thank you for co-creating with me. Mm. No questions. I'm always happy to answer anything that you have uh, to throw my way. And in this time of challenge and divisiveness and pandemic finally maybe coming to an end, but lots of other unrest that we face out there. I have two thoughts to leave with everybody. The first one is that a smile is a little curve that sets a lot of things straight. And the second one is, and therefore, if someone needs a smile, please give them yours. Mm, gosh, such a simple thing that goes such a long way. You think of just, you know, even passing a stranger on the street and receiving a smile, what a gift that is. A hundred percent. That's right. Yeah. And it doesn't even cost anything. It's really inexpensive. <laughs> right? Free. It's free, you guys. I love that. Such a beautiful uh, thought to end on. Ridgely, such a pleasure to connect with you. It always has been. And I'm so glad we finally did this. I feel like there's so much more we could talk about. So I might have to have you back for round two. Um, okay. <laughs> but yes, I appreciate you. I'm super excited to to connect people to some of the resources that you've created. I know they're phenomenal. I've watched you present. So thank you again, really appreciate you. And thank you.